So I went for a walk on a beach the other day uh, with my daughter and the dog because someone had told me that on this beach there were some rocks which were very similar to the ones on Mars. I looked all along the shoreline, looking, 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 and finally I found one. Here it is. <laughs> so you can see this is a mudstone and it has these veins, just like these ones on Mars, photographed recently. So I was really excited, and I shouted to my daughter, hey, Eva, come and look at this rock, it's really exciting, it's just like the ones on Mars. And she said, no thanks, Mum, that's your thing, and ran off to play with the dog. She was right. Space and other planets is my thing. And ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. And I've been lucky enough, I haven't become an astronaut yet, but I've been lucky enough to work as a space engineer for uh, various space agencies, including NASA, the European Space Agency, uh, space companies, including Airbus and Thales Alenia Space, who I currently work for and here at the University of Bristol, where I get to teach young people about spacecraft design. This is me <coughs> coming to work in the morning, and this is me going home in the evening. <laughs> Tired, but happy. You can see I haven't let go of my dreams. In this talk today, I'd like to share with you some of the work that we've been doing in the search for life on Mars. But first, I'd like to ask you, hands up if you think there is life on Mars. Okay. Ooh, quite a lot of you. Okay, I, think I would say that's about half the audience. Thank you. Well, today we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at how can life survive, that is, what conditions are there on Mars, and what kind of conditions do we need for life. We can look at how can we look for life, so that means the spacecraft missions and the instruments, and why should we bother to look anyway? Okay, let's start with how can life survive. We know that Earth and Mars are very different. For a start, Mars is half the size. And then the Earth is much nearer to the Sun, so it's warmer. An average temperature on Earth is about 15 degrees C, and the average temperature on Mars is about minus 60 degrees C. That's like a bad day in the Arctic. Another difference is this thin blue line. That is our precious, dense atmosphere. And that means we have oxygen to breathe and water to drink. Mars has a weedy, thin carbon dioxide atmosphere. And it also has solid carbon dioxide on the ground in the highlands. And I've got some of that to show you as well. So it's very cold, so I'm putting my cycle glove on. <laughs> I don't want to burn myself. And uh, you remember this stuff because it's the stuff they use in films and effects. Because if I throw some into some warm water, like this, then that happens. Okay. <laughs> so there's solid carbon dioxide on the ground. A last difference between Earth and Mars is that it's something invisible. It's the Earth's magnetic field, or the magnetosphere. Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. Mars lost its magnetic field, so radiation rains down on the surface. How could life 
possibly survive in this cold, hostile environment flooded with radiation? To find out, we need to know the conditions for life. And the people who study this are called exobiologists. And they think for, for life to thrive, we need three things. We need nutrients or food, we need a source of energy, like the sun, and we need a liquid, like water. Because Mars is so hostile, any life there is likely to be microbial or really tiny, and happiest in extreme conditions. This kind of organism is called an extremophile. And as an example, let's meet the tardigrade. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Don't be deceived by it looking like an old dust bag. <laughs> this little creature is really tough. It can survive freezing, boiling, starvation, dehydration, and radiation. If you're still not impressed, NASA launched some, thrust them outside into the vacuum of space, poor things, and they survived for 10 days. Amazing creatures. So we have answered our first question, how can life survive? It needs to be microbial and extremophile. Our second question is how can we look for life? We can do this in two ways. We can go to Mars and look there, or we can get some Mars rocks and bring them back to the Earth. Let's start with going to Mars. There have been 41 missions to Mars, 42 if you include the latest European mission, which is called uh, ExoMars, which went up in March 2016. Of those 42 missions, only 17 have actually made it there. Getting to Mars is hard. This is one of the missions that made it there successfully, Mars Express. And I worked on this mission a few years ago. My job was to look after the instruments. And they include a camera to take images of the surface, a spectrometer to do chemical analysis of the surface, and a radar to look beneath the surface. On Earth, uh, of course, we have much more sophisticated instruments than anything we could possibly fit inside a space rocket. But bringing a rock back is a massive mission, which many of us have been working on. We need to send a lander to Mars, we need to dig out some bits of soil, put them in a safe container, like this one, inside lots of other containers, and then on a rocket like this one. That rocket then leaves the surface of Mars to get back to the Earth. Building this rocket is one of the trickiest bits of the mission, but luckily all rockets work on the same principle, the principle of conservation of momentum. And I've got a demo of that to show you. So I'm just going to take my cycle gloves. Okay, uh, a few safety measures first. <laughs> Why do I agree to do these things? <laughs> okay, so regardless of whether we're in water, on the Earth, or on Mars, if we eject mass in one direction, then as momentum is conserved, then we should go in the other direction. Okay, let's test it out. Uh, as this is a sort of launch, could you humour me with a countdown? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to count five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Yes. 
So, building the rocket is one tricky bit. Where I work, uh, we've been... Let me just get my thing. Where I work, we've been working on, uh, as part of a European team called Eurocares, uh, designing a building to house the Martian samples when they get back to the Earth. We have a great responsibility with this building as we need to protect the Earth against any possible Martian biological material. To do this, we've been working with experts in biocontainment. And this is a high-safety biocontainment lab where they work with Ebola and other viruses. These guys will help us from, the, uh, from stopping the Mars organisms or Mars material from getting out of the container. But we also need to stop any Earth material from getting into the container. And to do this, we're working with lunar sample experts, like these guys. This is a European NASA team. These are actually rocks from the moon uh, that were brought back by the Apollo missions. OK, so that's all in the future. Uh, but what have we found so far? We have found carbon and hydrogen molecules in the rocks. Okay, that's really significant because that means there could be nutrients uh, on the surface of Mars. There's been lots of evidence of different kinds to show that there was liquid water in the past. And this is a river delta on Mars. You remember that radar? The radar found that there is water ice underneath the poles. Okay, so together we have nutrients, there's plenty of energy, uh, there's sources of energy like the sun, chemical reactions, possible geothermal activity, and there is evidence of liquid water in the past. If we could find liquid water underground on Mars, then there could be life now. So that answers our second question, how can we look for life? I did an earlier version of this talk for my sister, who works in a council where there's serious cuts. And she said to me, you know, Lucy, I'd really like to care about whether there's life on Mars, but couldn't we spend that money on solving our problems here on the Earth first? And I know there'll be some of you out there who are thinking the same thing. I could reply that the money that is spent on Mars and space exploration doesn't get launched into orbit. Most of it goes on the salaries of thousands of highly skilled workers uh, here in a high-tech industry here on Earth, and uh, they pay their taxes, they support the economy, and they develop amazing technologies like better breast cancer diagnosis, hurricane monitoring, weather prediction, uh, and so on. And those benefit everyone. I could reply that space and Mars exploration inspires our young people and helps them to dream. If we tell them they might be a Mars astronaut or a drive Mars rovers one day, then it, it'll, it'll help them to think about future science and engineering careers. Our young people need their dreams, particularly in hard times. It gives them hope for the future. I could reply that exploring Mars is part of being human. It's human to be curious, to explore. Exploring Mars and looking for life on Mars will prepare us for human missions to Mars. And my daughter may have said, no thanks, Mum, but would she change her mind if her daughter were living on Mars and she wanted to visit? If it turns out there is no life on Mars, then the first life uh, on Mars could be the first humans who go there. One of you could be the first life on Mars. But for me, it's personal. For me, it's spiritual. 
Thinking about space gives me perspective. If I ever feel down, then I think how small my problems are in the scale of the whole world, of the solar system, of the galaxy, of the universe. If I feel afraid, I say to myself, we've been to the moon. If I ever feel alone, then I remind myself that I am made of stardust. I am a part of the universe and everything in it. I guess that I hope we're not alone, and that's why I'm searching for life on Mars. Thank you very much.